Uh, Justin West, Local 2488, Mitsubishi Motors, Region 4, Dennis Williams, Director. I'm speaking in opposition to this resolution regarding income security issues. Two tiers is killing this union. This resolution hardly mentions tiered wage scales. Delphi executives continue to extract bonuses as rewards for their heinous attack on workers across the globe. Ford rewards its executives with bonuses for extracting wage and benefit concessions from their workers and retirees. Now Daimler Chrysler is in the midst of their continued profitable corporate record, and they're seeking to cover it all up so they can join the concessions bandwagon. We, the membership, as elected representatives from across the nation, Canada and Puerto Rico, for varying industries and job classifications, need to share with this leadership of the international and with each other just what is going on with ideas to combat the corporate economic terrorism being foisted upon all working people across the globe. How do we fight back? When will it end? Let there be no doubt that the UAW is in a fight for its survival. The media calls it a fight for relevance. Meantime, the UAW International's approach has been to espouse lately good things come from competitive corporations. Partnerships fostering cooperation with, uh, partnerships fostering cooperation with corporations is the way to go. Brother Gettelfinger gave a tremendous opening speech, but even within his oration, he stated we should not confuse cooperation with capitulation. Brother Gettelfinger, I'm from Peoria, Illinois, and I was at the convention in 1998 when our late president, Steve Jokic, called the concessionary field con uh, settlement at Caterpillar Tractor a victory. Caterpillar is hiring right now, second tier wages, no benefits, no seniority, full-time temporaries. Concessions, be they at GM, Ford, Chrysler, American Axle, Delphi, Visteon, Mitsubishi, Numi, etc., will be no victory. Brother Gettelfinger, we gave uh, Delphi the GM plants. We gave Delphi two-tier wages. We gave Delphi the GM workers' pensions. But these concessions have not sated that corporation's thirst for more blood in this race to the bottom. Delphi has declared a bankruptcy organized to destroy every last shed shred of dignity and security that generations of union members fought and sacrificed to achieve. My point is, Brother Gettelfinger, concessions do not save jobs. And to you and, and the other rest of the international, I urge you not to confuse concessions with victory. Well, to get a finger, you say much of these problems need to be addressed through government legislation. I agree a lot of that. But this is not a VCAP convention. This is a bargaining convention. And I ask you, what can we as workers do directly now to help fight this onslaught of corporate greed before the big three talks on our jobs, at our locals, amongst our brothers and sisters. Through this body, I urge you to vote this resolution down until we address strategies to mobilize and fight back at the grassroots level. And lastly, I want to thank you, Brother Gittlefinger, for mentioning the struggle at Con Selmer, the Vincent Bach plant. Those locked out members are on the front line suffering, but hanging in there to defend the American dream. Thank you. What's your impression so far of, of this bargaining convention? The, the tone of this bargaining convention? Well, I, I'm impressed actually that there's a lot of people who are prepared for a serious fight. I'm not convinced that the union is doing what it needs to do to organize that fight. Uh, for example, there was that person who got up and uh, even though was very fearful of uh, challenging the leadership, you know, felt it absolutely necessary to report that two-tier yes. was a disaster in this plant. Uh, you have other people who are getting up, trying to get the message across that the skilled trades are under attack and are asking for support. And you, you, so, I, I think people understand that something needs to be done. They're still hoping that the union will organize to fight for them. But I think the union has to do something different than it's done in the past and actually begin to mobilize its members, not just simply think it can walk into bargaining and put good language on the table and win anything. I mean, what people, I, I think the Chrysler, um, quote, sale should once and for all convince people that there are no partners with management. Um, 
that management will do what the sh shareholders want, and if that means throwing out or destroying the membership, that's what they'll do. And so the only way that we'll be able to uh, get anything in here is the extent to which we're organized to fight and make demands. And that's what the union still has to do. In, in, you know, I, I'm hearing more people say I rise in opposition because the language isn't strong enough, more than I've heard at past conventions. Do you think that the international's hearing that or that they, can, they will respond to that in any kind of a constructive way? I don't have enough experience at previous conventions to know to the extent to which the international does respond to, this, to these things. I, I think we'll have to wait and see. I, I would hope that they would respond to it, but I have no confidence that they will. So I think we have to continue trying to do the right thing. I mean, the very first thing that should be happening, for example, in Chrysler, is that they'd be calling Chrysler Council meetings, bring Jeep back into the Chrysler Council and be having meetings over and over to discuss how we will act together as a union in Chrysler, how we will not let and, you know, one local or one section of the company be discarded while they sell off, say, the most profitable sections. But that requires getting all the locals together and actually having that discussion. And basically threatening the anybody who's going to buy this company that it's not going to, this union will not allow them to carve up the uh, carve up Chrysler and discard the pieces that it wants to. Who has the power to call that type of meeting? Is that entirely dependent on the international? Or could the bargaining council, could a, could a couple of local presidents say, we're going to call this meeting? Could they pressure that? I assume a couple of presidents could do that. I, I don't think at this point, you can tell from in, in here, um, most of the members are too much afraid of not having international support to even raise their hands to ask that we not have this book, awful book read to us. I mean, it's not that the book is awful, but it's this awful act of reading in this, in this book. I mean, people are very frightened of taking on the international. And so I think that if we're going to be effective against Chrysler, it will depend on the international actually calling it. Now, I would like to see local presidents call such a meeting. But most, I think, will try to work through the Chrysler Department. It is true that this Chrysler Department is much improved over Nate Goodman. And so it's possible that it may actually do that. Do you think that, uh, you know, do you, that Chrysler will be the target? Are they going to set them up first? I, I, I mean, it was believed while Chrysler was profitable and before all this sales stuff happened, that Chrysler would be the target. But now that GM appears to be profitable, there's talk that GM might be the target. And Chrysler would be too. Yeah, so I, I have no idea I, uh, on that. And I've never been right when I have made the prediction. What can we do? to, um, as union members, delegates, rank and file do, to pressure the international to meet our needs, and our needs being stronger contracts. Well, I would think that the first thing would be to start with resolutions in locals, and then try to organize locals to actually start taking some action in their locals against, you know, acting like a union in the plant, where we start having group grievances where everybody puts in, in preparation for this contract, safety and health grievances, uh, work standards grievances, strikeable grievances, uh, so that we can actually threat, have something to threaten the company with. So to give the company the impression that there's a militancy on the shop floor? There's militancy. I mean, it, just the simple things like people starting to save money so that they can go out on strike. They, the company will not respect anything except a membership that's willing to withhold its labor in one form or another. And as long as they think people are running scared, they're just going to keep laying on more and more of uh, the concessionary demands. This book does not make as a principle no two-tier. It in fact does the opposite. It, sort of implies that two-tier would be acceptable under certain circumstances. 
as far as I'm concerned, if the union has to make sacrifices in dealing with certain employers, the most important thing to do is preserve solidarity, and that means equality of sacrifice. And that's how the union maintains its strength. But the problem is that two-tier is the easiest thing uh, for a union leadership to do because it seems like it hurts no one politically, um, namely all the current people, voters and all the current members and all the current leaders can all go without sacrifice and the people who sacrifice are the new hires. But once those new hires get into the plant, it becomes just an impossible situation to maintain solidarity. If you're working next to somebody who makes $10 an hour more than you and who voted to keep their higher wages at your expense, don't ask me to defend them when management comes after them. And management will come after them because, after all, if you, there's a second tier, well, why not get rid of the first tier then? And so it just increases the probability and the pressure that management will put on the, first, on, on the higher wages. So you, you lose solidarity. I call it a cancer, and it really is. No union maintains solidarity that has two tiers. And this union should take a principled position that two-tier negotiate, two-tier solutions are out of the question in any circumstance. Have to give something, then let them give, uh, share, and everybody will share the sacrifice. I'm Dan Hagen, Local 136, Region 5, under the leadership of Jim Wells, Regional Director, Assistant Director Gary Jones, and home of the 2006 World Champions, St. Louis. I rise in support of the resolution that the resolution committee brought out onto the floor with 46 million uninsured, underinsured Americans in this country. The past Republican administration for the last six years has not dealt with health care. For example, when they passed the law with the Medicare D, and they negotiated a plan where a member signs up and they have to stay in that plan for one year, but the pharmaceutical companies can change a cost of that prescription every seven days, that's not in the best interest of the Americans. When the bankruptcy judges rules in favor of the corporations, and they take away the health care of the retirees, and then the reorganization that companies such as the steel workers are making a profit nowadays. Those retirees have lost their health care forever. And the corporations are reaping millions and millions of dollars in profits. Next thing, employers are shifting costs and risk to individuals. And we need to resist such programs, such as the HSA, the health saving accounts, we need to adjust benefits for increases in medical inflation. We need to resist employers' attacks of all kinds on the retirees' health care. The UAW needs to stay committed to a universal single-payer plan to provide quality health care to all Americans, rich, poor, active, and the retirees. Health care in this country is not being addressed in the best interest of Americans. And it's bigger than a corporation in UAW. That is why it's so very important to participate in the VCAP, which strength, strengthens the UAW negotiated contract. Thank you. And I'd like to remind everyone that this, the roots of organized labor, specifically the UAW, are buried deep in the social movement. When Walter Ruther walked in Selma, Alabama, it with Martin Luther King, it wasn't because he was going to get his picture in the paper, it's because it was the right thing to do. We've been doing the right thing since the inception of the United Auto Workers. And standing by the poor and the lesser fortunate is our job and our duty and our obligation. That's what the UAW stands for, it's a community action program. We can't forget our roots. When President Bush created the Department of Homeland Security, he eliminated the collective bargaining for hundreds of thousands of federal workers, stating that their union rights and union power would prevent him from doing his job in the time of duty. 363 firefighters lost their lives on 911. 
Every one of them was a Union member. 363 men rushed back into those burning towers to save people and bring them back out. Go went back in again until they were gone. Tell their families, tell the survivors' families that Union rules get in the way of protecting people. I'm tired of it. I know this executive board is tired of it. We've got to start standing up. And I only have one question. If union rights had prevented the president from doing his job in a time of crisis, what was his excuse after Hurricane Katrina? I stand in favor. Uh, I stand in favor of these resolutions. Thank you. Millions of people all over America are thinking about jobs today. Post-war jobs. Jobs with a future. And thousands of young men are turning to one of the best employment agencies in the world, the regular army recruiting offices. This fellow looks like a satisfied customer. How about it, Joe? Got yourself a new job? Me? Yeah, I just re-enlisted. I suppose you could call it a new job at that, because life in the regular army in peacetime is a lot different from what we just went through. Good for you, Joe. By the way, are you married? I sure am. Don't I look it? What does your wife think about your re-enlisting? <laughs> well, you don't see me all cut and bruised, do you? Anyway, she's right over there. Let's ask her. Well, darling, I'm in. How do you like the idea of being an army wife? I love it, Joe. You know that. Oh, I think it's a perfectly grand idea. And am I glad I listened to reason when Joe first thought about signing up? Believe me, folks, regular army life in peacetime looks good to us. It's really a slick idea. Good job, good pay when you consider all the extra advantages. Why, we can see this country of ours, travel and learn things. And what's more, Joe can retire with an income that ranges from half pay after 20 years all the way up to three-quarters pay after 30 years in service. And for a first sergeant, that means $155 a month. That's a lot better than we could do in a civilian job. So if your boyfriend or husband is thinking about the regular army as a lifetime career, tell him to talk it over at the nearest recruiting office. It might prove to be the beginning of real living for you the way it has for us. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa.